As violent as all that was, it was made out to be even more violent in the media as an excuse to paint the people, the, the Cherokees out in, in Oklahoma and Appalachians as being backward, violent, and uncivilized. And so they were able to come in and take their resources. All right, looks like... Uh, Looks like we have a quorum. Yeah. Well, there are two or three folks that I haven't met before. I'm Troy Smith. Uh, I am a, a history professor at Tennessee Tech. And uh, I have been, I think, greatly, greatly blessed to have the opportunity to find out about NASO and about High and, 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 and Tom and everyone else and, and, and their work and be able to be involved in it somewhat, and I'm just absolutely delighted and honored to be able to do that. And um, this six-part series is going to be focusing on red power, and in a way, sort of like going right along with that, is it's focusing on native sovereignty, because Red power was a way to try to protect and expand that sovereignty. So we're going to spend some time talking about what that means. And that's what, uh, that's what tonight is for. And I was uh, telling the folks earlier that I don't have any uh, fancy presentations or anything. Uh, tonight, I probably will have some, uh, some slides and, and, and pictures later on. Uh, but I'm just going to be sort of... Uh, being in my natural habitat and just like, you know, sitting here talking. Um, like, like Catherine said previously, uh, probably about half of you were in the uh, other Native American thing I did, uh, the 2020 edition. That was basically an overview of, a really, really quick overview of Native culture and history. Um, you can go to my blog site which I, I, I mentioned this before uh, uh, in this venue, but never got around to actually doing it. <clears throat> doing it, but it's up now. I've put up the first five lecture videos from my U.S. history class, um, which is about three, three or four hours worth. Um, when I teach U basic U.S. history, I don't get to white people until Friday of the second week. I spend the first two weeks talking native culture before the arrival of Europeans and also just a basic overview of, of native culture. I really strongly believe, uh, for one thing, I think that anyone who has a PhD in U.S. history um, should have to take graduate level courses in uh, American Indian studies because I really feel like you can't understand U.S. history if you're only looking at it from one perspective. If you don't understand the perspective of the people that were already here, you don't understand half the stuff that's going on uh, you know, when you're learning about it in a US history course. Now, uh, I tell you that so that, you know, if you want to, we don't, I guess we could, we could give extra credit. I'll double your grade <laughs> uh, if you, uh, but that's available uh, to you. Let me tell you where it is. It's. Uh, my blog site is called TN Wordsmith, all one word, TN blogspot.com. So I got those five up there. I also, uh, a month or two ago, I put up uh, three lectures, a three lecture series that I did about uh, uh, the market revolution in the 1830s, if that's the kind of stuff that excites you. Uh, but 
we're really uh, not going to be able to get into the culture in this kind of depth because we're this time becoming more specific, right? We're talking about uh, red power in the 1960s and 70s, uh, late 60s, early 70s, especially. And, you know, that's something that I'm sure all of you are, are familiar with. Some of you probably remember when this stuff was was on the news and when it was happening, you know, like the uh, occupation of Alcatraz, uh, siege at, at Wounded Knee. Those are things that we're going to be looking at in great detail. And um, I don't know if you ever heard the expression red power in connection with that. There were several organizations. There were uh, Indians of all nations. Uh, of course, there was the American Indian movement and many others, but red power is kind of like the over encompassing description of that movement. And if you have heard it before, or if you're just hearing it now, I'm sure you've noted the similarity to another movement going on at the same time, which was the black power movement which historians, you know, historians like to periodize things and then argue with each other over when the periods start and end. Uh, so <laughs> I'm, I'm going to be kind of uh, uh, approximate here. But what historians call the Black Freedom Movement, roughly from the mid-1950s to the mid-1970s, was comprised of two separate eras that together made up the Black Freedom Movement, that is the Civil Rights Movement, mid-50s to mid-60s, and then the Black Power Movement, which grew out of that, was similar to that, but was also very different, as I'm sure you're aware, right? There was a, a, a feeling of frustration among a lot of especially younger African-American activists that the middle-aged and older African-American activists were going, uh, we're being too respectable. Uh, we're going too slowly. We're not going far enough. And so things kind of went in a different direction. Um, and I would argue, in fact, I do argue that whereas in the media that's presented as these are the good civil rights people and those are the scary bad ones, that both those things work together probably weren't expecting so much African-American stuff. Neither was I, but I never know what's going to happen when I start talking. Uh, Malcolm X predates the Black Power Movement by just a little bit, but he was a harbinger of it. Both of them were, I think, equally important. Uh, and uh, I don't think that the successes that came about in the 70s would have happened if both of them hadn't been in play. Well, something similar is going on with young Native Americans. Um, there was a feeling that some of the uh, uh, some of the, the folks who had been working on sovereignty issues for a long time, there were organizations, one a big one that's still around, the National Congress of American Indians has been very important, uh, established in the 1940s, uh, kind of a civil rights type approach. And a lot of young Native Americans felt like uh, there needed to be um, more direct action. Uh, and so uh, it started in Minneapolis the, with the American Indian Movement, basically being inspired by the Black Panthers in Oakland, who had started uh, as basically a group whose main, main purpose was to police the police, right? To be present uh, when uh, the police were apprehending people because of all the brutality. Similar thing was going on with the, uh, the American Indian movement. And there was some degree of uh, disconnect. You know, um, you may remember when sometimes some African-American people were referred to um, more accommodationist in their view, black people as Uncle Toms, remember that? Um, there was an expression in the uh, Indian activist community, the of Uncle Tomahawks or of apples because they're red on the outside, but white on the inside. The, the big difference, the big difference between whether we're talking about the National Congress of American Indians or the more direct action folks of the Red Power Movement, uh, the big difference between them 
and the Black Freedom Movement. There's a the uh, the, uh, the strategies and the tactics were similar, but the overall goals were very different because the overall goal of the Civil Rights Movement was for Black Americans to be able to, you know, have uh, the full experience of their civil rights, of their rights as American citizens, to be included and not segregated. Right? The uh, the Americans were looking for the opposite of that. They were fighting not to be absorbed, not to be forcibly included, but to be able to maintain a a separate identity, a tribal national identity. Now, there were some, uh, some, some things in the news the last couple of years that I pasted like crazy on, 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 on Facebook because that's how I roll. I don't know if you saw any of these, but um, there was a move in the Trump administration to classify Native American as a racial group in a way it hasn't been before. And there was a lot of resistance to that from Native Americans. And that's because if it were brought clearly down to that binary, well, not black and white, but red and white, I guess, then that would uh, give the federal government the leverage and the excuse to pay no further attention to the national sovereign identities of the individual tribes, right? If they could lump them all together as a, as a race. So they're still fighting to maintain their sovereignty. But what does that even mean? Uh, particularly in a situation where you've got these reservations that are located in the United States and American Indians are American citizens. Anybody want to guess when American Indians became American citizens? Just take a wild guess. 1930. Oh. Hey, that's pretty close. 1924. So the 14th Amendment, the one that says anyone born in the United States is a citizen, specifically did not apply to Native Americans. Because at that time, they were considered citizens of their tribe, not of the US. So anyway, that's the important thing to, to have in mind is that the struggle has always been to defend sovereignty and tribal identity so as not to just be absorbed and lose their uniqueness and their Indianness. <clears throat> so uh, for the next, I guess, well, this may stretch into next time because uh, I want to talk for about uh, until about 750 and then take questions in the in the past uh, last last time around. Technically, this goes until eight o'clock. But I'm willing to hang around if people have questions after that for a little while. OK, so what I'm going to do now is kind of trace the history. Of the federal governments. And recognition of tribal identity. So the very first American Indian that the United States government signed a treaty with was the Delaware or Lenape tribe. Anybody want to guess when that was? This one's kind of easy. 1776. The American Revolution was going on. They wanted an alliance. The U.S. government wanted an alliance with this tribe and other tribes against the British and their allied tribes. So that was the first treaty. There were a lot of treaties thereafter. Um, as time went on, particularly after the Constitution was, uh, was ratified, uh, there started to be questions arise as to uh, just how how many uh, how many rights, what kind of rights do these tribes have? And there wound up being three court cases, three very important Supreme Court cases in the 1820s and 1830s. Uh, this is they're called the Marshall Trilogy. Sounds like a sounds like an exciting new Marvel movie. 
Um, but uh, John Marshall was the uh, chief justice of the Supreme Court when these three cases were decided. So by the way, this is probably going to be the driest part. Um, but it's stuff that we kind of have to get through. Uh, also, by the way, in addition to uh, teaching Cherokee history, I also teach a class at Tennessee Tech uh, of American Indian law. All right, so the first case that came before the Marshall Court was in 1823. Um, it was uh, um, it was a situation that uh, was in had had happened in in Illinois. Um, I'm just uh, I'm, I'm going to check just something real quick. I can never remember the name of this. Uh, Indian tribe. I think it was Plankinaw. Uh, yeah, that's what it was. So anyway, this is the case of Johnson versus McIntosh. And what had happened is that back in the uh, 1770s, the Johnson family, again, I always get these two guys mixed up. I'm pretty sure it was the Johnsons that came first. Um, they had bought a little parcel of land from the Plankinaw Indians in Illinois and established a farm there. Then um, the Northwest Ordinance of 1787 uh, was passed uh, in which all of the modern day Midwest was divided up into grids and offered up for sale to US citizens. So that was done, the McIntosh family bought this lot of land the US government was selling because they sold all that public land. Then the Johnson family was like, wait a minute, this is our land. We bought it from the Indians. So it had to be decided how that's gonna turn out. And uh, it went against the original family because in the, uh, in the famous written ruling uh, by, written by, by Marshall, he explained, he went through a history of colonization and essentially, uh, utilize the doctrine of discovery, which uh, the doctrine of discovery is that if you discover land that no one is using and no one owns, then finders keepers. The first people who get there own it. And the view of the European world was that Indians had no concept of land ownership Therefore, they didn't own the land. They kind of went along with the land like the animals. So their prior habitation did not count as ownership. Right. So when the Spanish came to everything, according to Marshall, that was the first ownership. And by various means through uh, uh, diplomacy and or conquest, uh, those things passed ultimately to the British and then to the U.S. government. So then the US government, he ruled, owns all the public land within the boundaries of the United States. So those Indian tribes who are living there have the right of habitation, but they don't have ownership rights. They have usufruct rights with the right to use the land. Um, therefore, when that first family bought that uh, bought that plot of land from that uh, individual Indian tribe, it didn't count because the Indian tribe didn't have the right to sell it. They didn't own it. By the way, uh, this is kind of a, a side point, but it's worth noting. Um, the, uh, the Spanish starting, the first thing Columbus did when he got home was uh, he and Ferdinand and Isabella got some lawyers together uh, to figure out how they were gonna frame this so they could keep everything they found. Um, and essentially it was ruled that because of the doctrine of discovery, finders keepers is a natural right. If the Indians in the new world tried to interfere with the Europeans efforts to utilize what they had discovered and therefore owned, the Europeans had the right to kill them in self-defense in advance to protect their property that these Indians were living on. Um, and that was predicated on a papal bull during the Crusades, giving the Crusaders the right to take that approach uh, to the Muslim peoples in the Middle East. So 
because the US legal system is a system of precedence, everything to American Indian law today has as its precedent the Marshall decisions. The Marshall decisions had as their precedent English policy, Spanish policy, and before that, the Crusades. Uh, that's kind of messed up. Uh, but anyway, so basically he said, okay, the Indians didn't own the land, didn't have the right to sell it. Uh, the uh, second uh, case was in 1831, case of uh, the Cherokee Nation versus Georgia. Now, as the 1820s were moving along, more and more people in the South, white people in the South, wanted the Indians gone because they wanted their land. And here is where uh, unintended consequences come in. Eli Whitney was a smart guy and he liked to invent things. Uh, first thing that he invented that was a big success was uh, machined interchangeable parts for muskets. So you didn't have to go to a gunsmith, you could get your parts ready made. Then he applied that to a machine uh, to process cotton, which no one had grown cotton very much in the US because it was too labor intensive because it takes so much time to pick out all the little seeds. So that if you had your manpower working on that, your profit margin would be down for what you were using. Then uh, the cotton gen comes along and all of a sudden it's very lucrative to uh, process cotton. That meant that slavery, which many people in the founding fathers generation believed was going to fade away and was in the process of fading away got a huge shot in the arm because now everybody's wanting to grow cotton and what do they need to grow cotton? They need labor and they need land. And the Indians had all that land in the cotton belt, right? In Georgia and Alabama and Mississippi. So more and more moved to, to forcibly uh, remove the Indians and states in the South started uh, kind of jumping ahead of the federal government and in particular, Georgia passed some very restrictive laws pertaining to um, the Cherokees. They had already chased the creeks out of, uh, well, no, the, the Alabama had chased the creeks out of Alabama into Georgia. Anyway, um, what, uh, what law that the uh, Georgia legislature passed particularly was, they made it illegal for a white person to live among the Indians without a state license. Now, what's that all about? Well, what's, what that's all about was there were a lot of missionaries, missionaries from up north who were living among the Cherokees uh, who had been invited in to teach their kids to read and write, uh, which is what the Cherokees were trying to do. Uh, then they were sending their kids on to college from there and they were becoming lawyers themselves. Uh, but the view was these missionaries were stirring up trouble and giving the Indians ideas. Uh, so this is a way to separate them. Um, and also this state law said that uh, there is no such thing as a Cherokee government. You live in the borders of our state, you have to follow the laws of our state and you have no laws and no say. So uh, John Ross, who was uh, otherwise known as Guwiskui, was his Cherokee name, principal chief of the Cherokees, uh, engaged lawyers and they took the state of Georgia to court. It went to the Supreme Court, and once again, it came before uh, the court under the uh, leadership of John Marshall. And this one, Marshall and the court in general refused to hear all the way through because the court ruled that because Cherokees are not US citizens, they can't sue a state in, in federal court. They have no authority to do that. And it was here that Marshall, again, in one of his long historical uh, context giving uh, uh, writings, explained that um, the situation with Indians, they were nations, but they were not sovereign nations. They were, in his words, domestic dependent nations. So he compared it to the relationship between a ward and their guardian. And when I used to hear about wards, I always used to think of uh, Batman and Robin. How lucky was that kid, right? He's the richest guy in town. Um, but uh, my wife and I, a few years ago, uh, were foster parents 
for a, uh, um, a young lady from, from Mississippi. And so for the time that she lived with us, uh, we were her legal guardians, even though we weren't her parents and didn't have parental rights. But as her guardians, we got to make the decisions about medical stuff, about educational stuff, about her money. That's how that works. So that's what he's saying. Indians are to the federal government. Permanent children that the government looks after and makes decisions for. They're nations, but they're not really autonomous, but they do have a degree of nationhood. And he further specified, and he didn't really need to specify this, I don't think, because it's in the constitution, but that's part of what the, Const the Supreme Court is for, right? To articulate what is and is not constitutional. Uh, according to the Commerce Clause in the Constitution, only Congress has the authority to treat and trade with Indian tribes. Only the U.S. Congress. So only the, uh, the federal government. That means state government has no authority. Uh, so that was, uh, um, it's kind of like, well, I'm getting ahead of myself. That was kind of the argument in the, in the next case. But essentially, he was kind of sympathetic to the Cherokees. It's like, I'm sorry, though, but, you know, we can't hear your case because you're not citizens. So uh, the next case that came about the next year, they found themselves an American citizen, one of those missionaries, actually several of those missionaries, um, uh, who were living among them and refused to apply for licenses from the state of Georgia, which they wouldn't have gotten anyway. Uh, and so they were arrested for violating that state law and sent to prison for two or three years, consigned to hard labor. But they were U.S. citizens and they could sue the state of Georgia. So the Cherokee Nation just paid the same lawyers to represent them. Uh, and it's known as the case of uh, Worcester versus the state of, of Georgia. Worcester was... Uh, uh, the principal of the Samuel Worcester of these uh, missionaries. And in that case, that's the one where Marshall said, okay, states do not have the authority. Georgia never had the authority to pass these laws pertaining to what Cherokees did on Cherokee land. Only the federal government can. Uh, so they couldn't be doing that. They couldn't be agitating to move them uh, on the state level as they were. And President Andrew Jackson, who had gotten elected on a promise to remove the Indians in the South, famously, well, this is a quote that no one is sure if he said it in these exact words, but there are several cases of him saying practically the same thing in other words. Um, Mr. Marshall made his decision, let's let him enforce it. Well, Supreme Court doesn't have the authority to enforce what they rule. That's the job of the executive branch. So the executive branch and the president of the United States refused to enforce the ruling of the Supreme Court. Um, so the Cherokees won the case, but they lost overall uh, because in fact, uh, federal troops were sent in to help the states of Georgia, Tennessee, North Carolina, et cetera, forcibly remove the Cherokees. Um, all that, all those things that Marshall wrote about Indians not owning land, about Indians being wards of the state, basically, and about them being nations, but not in the fullest sense of the term. All those things are still the basis of U.S. federal law pertaining to American Indians. All right. Well, after that, um, there were, well, several interesting cases I wish I had time to, to get into, uh, but I'm going to jump ahead to 1871. Uh, another big important uh, thing happened, Congressional Act, the Indian Appropriations Act of 1871. And what that did was it ended the treaty era. It ended recognition of tribes as independent nations or of having to have treaties because treaties are things that one sovereign polity does with another sovereign polity. 
and these Indian tribes were no longer recognized. Why were they no longer recognized? Because most of them had been pacified. Most of them had been defeated, lost their land, or were in the process of it. Uh, so now it was safe to make that assertion. So no more treaties after that. No new treaties were made. Now, uh, in 1883, there was a, a, an important criminal case in the Great Sioux Reservation up there in the Dakotas. Uh, and it was a case involving a Lakota a leader named Crow Dog who had been one of the uh, Sioux leaders who had been fighting against the United States alongside uh, Sitting Bull and Crazy Horse. And there was another Lakota leader named Spotted Tail, and he was more of an accommodationist. Uh, he, had, he was the one that was willing to sign things away. Therefore, he's the one that the uh, U.S. government and the white people in neighboring states really, really liked. He was a good Indian, right, because he didn't resist. Uh, Crow Dog was a bad Indian because he shot him. <laughs> He got, he, he got fed up and just shot him dead. Uh, when that happened, then the traditional Lakota judicial approach kicked in, which is actually very similar to almost all North American Native tribes. If you kill someone in another tribe, then your tribe is culpable and someone, preferably you, if they can find you, has to die in turn. If you kill someone in your own tribe that's in a different clan from you, that clan has the, the right and the responsibility to find you and kill you. And if they can't find you, just kill somebody else in your group, right? But there was another option. It was called covering over. If you were the offending murdering party, uh, you could assuage the uh, bereaved family with a gift. And if they accepted it, it's like a fine. If they accepted it, the slate was clean. Crow Dog offered them, uh, I forget exactly what it was, like three rifles, four horses, and some blankets. Uh, and I think a couple of hundred dollars. And they took it. Case closed. Well, a lot of the, uh, a lot of the white folks living in the Dakota Territory at that time who liked Spotted Tail were outraged by this, outraged uh, that a good Indian could be murdered and soothed over with a couple of horses. So Crow Dog was arrested for murder, uh, arrested for murder and brought up in a federal court in Minnesota and uh, found guilty of murder. And then his pro bono lawyers appealed it and went to the Supreme Court uh, and it was finally decided in 1883, ex parte Crow Dog, in which the Supreme Court ruled neither the states nor the federal court have the authority to interfere with judicial proceedings when one Indian commits a crime against another Indian on a reservation or in Indian territory. So, Crow Dog was released, and people were even more outraged. Two years later, as a result of this, as more and more people in the West especially were calling for some kind of government intervention in this sort of thing, Congress passed the Major Crimes Act, which outlined seven uh, major crimes, murder, rape, uh, and so forth, kidnapping, uh, that were under federal jurisdiction, even in Indian country, even if it was one Indian committing it against another Indian in Indian country, the federal government, because the Indians can't be trusted to handle their own affairs because they're wards and see how they handled it with Crow Dog. Uh, therefore, the government has the authority to step in and take over those parts. And that's still the, the rule of uh, the law of the land. Um, so 
if you commit a crime, uh, if you commit murder on a reservation, whether you were an Indian or not an Indian, you will not be tried in tribal court. You'll be remanded to federal custody and you'll be tried in federal court. And I'm sure that most of you are familiar with the situation. It's been going on for a long time with missing and murdered Native women, that uh, Native American women get raped and murdered or disappear at a very disproportionately higher rate than any other group of women. And part of it is because of this jurisdictional situation that exists because of the Major Crimes Act, is that if you're a white guy, you can go onto a reservation, rape or murder a Native woman. They can't do anything about it. They can't arrest you. State authorities can't arrest you. Only federal authorities can arrest you, and federal authorities are usually too busy to bother with something happening on the reservation. So a lot of times it never really even gets looked into that much. That's why uh, that is such a problem. All right, well, that kind of um, set the stage for another law that was passed in Congress two years after that, 1887, the Dawes Act or the Allotment Act. Uh, Henry Dawes was a, uh, uh, a Republican, uh, which at that time was the Liberal Party, uh, Republican senator from Massachusetts, and he really wanted to help Indians kind of uh, adapt to American society and no longer be savage to civilize them. Um, I think that his intentions were good, but he had the kind of, um, well, almost uh, universal condescension of white people at the time toward native culture. Uh, so it was viewed that one of the big impediments to American Indians getting Americanized was their communal nature, including communal ownership of native lands. No individual Indian owned land. I mean, you could claim land to use, but it was the tribe's land. You couldn't sell it, only the tribe could sell it. And usually only with a referendum, only with a vote, with a uh, big majority of the people. Um, well, that sounds like a bunch of daggum communists uh, is what they were thinking at the time. Uh, and it's just un-American. So the US government with the uh, implementation of this law dissolved all tribal governments, except the five civilized tribes, because they're already civilized and the Iroquois tribes in New York, because they also were theoretically civilized, but everybody else dissolved their tribal governments, took away their land, redistributed it to give a section, an allotment to each family. So, and, and, and the name of the head of the family. And a lot of these tribes were matrilineal and some of them tended almost toward matriarchal. That didn't matter. It's the head of the family, the patriarch, the man of the house. Um, so the land is divided up. That means that the community was disrupted because Indians tended to live in towns and villages close to one another and have that communal lifestyle and all kinds of other things that came about as a result of this, not the least of which was, let's say that you've got a relatively small tribe on a relatively large reservation, like say the Cheyenne, who exists primarily by hunting, right? So you have to have a lot of land to range over. Let's say that that tribe is allotted and they divide all that land up and give each family some of the land. Well, here's, you know, here's like Wyoming. And here's the amount of land that they've used up by the time they give each family a small section and all the rest is left over that's public land that belongs to the U.S. government. So opened up for settlement. That's what, uh, that's what happened in Oklahoma, the Oklahoma land rush, when people just came swarming in there. Uh, that's uh, because they were allotting the various tribes, but not the five civilized tribes. Initially, 
except over the course of the next few years, more and more white people moving into Oklahoma were like, hey, those guys have the best land in Oklahoma and they're a bunch of savages. That's not right. So then they applied it to them and disestablished their governments. And then we got the state of Oklahoma. Uh, so there were a lot of uh, a lot of things that came about as a result of this, including the fact that you're supposed to be Americanized in addition to dividing up your land, pressuring people then to sell it because, hey, you're free, you can do that. And a lot of them did because they had no money. But also making them dress like white people, making the men cut their hair, taking their children away against their will and putting them in boarding schools in other states to civilize them, which that practice continued into the 1970s. Um, also making it illegal uh, for them to practice their traditional religions. And in these boarding schools, you couldn't speak your native language, you'd be punished. So basically trying to force them to be American. And that's where native people were at the dawn of the 20th century. And that, that period lasted for 30 or 40 years until the FDR administration when things moved the other direction. And I guess we'll wait and talk about that next time. So this might wind up being, I guess, a two-part uh, I still got uh, the Indian New Deal and the period known as termination to get to before we get to the 60s. So I'll stop talking and I'll answer any questions or entertain lively observations, whatever works. I just want to observe that this was a really infuriating class. <laughs> <laughs> and it made me mad like the whole time. Imagine a whole semester of it. Oh, I don't know if I could handle it. You know what? A lot of times I've had students that were so mad at the end of uh, American Indian law class or environmental history class, so mad, they started going out and getting involved. Oh, I feel it. <laughs> In fact, I had one young lady who um, took those classes and then wound up being a social worker at the Pine Ridge Reservation another young lady that went to law school and specialized in uh, federal Indian law and is practicing now. Uh, and I don't think either of them would have done that if they hadn't got so ticked off. Yeah, quite inspirational, thank you. Well, thank you for letting me ramble. Well, uh, what I was observing in the toward the end there, you were talking about the Indian children being taken away and sent to boarding school. Mm -hmm. That, that suddenly makes our current treatment of migrant children totally unsurprising, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Wasn't surprising to Indians. Right. You know this in a way. At the very beginning uh, of of this uh, of this meeting, Deanna mentioned the the, the mascot issue in uh, Putnam County. In grad school uh, at the University of Illinois. We were in the middle of efforts to get rid of uh, Chief Olinowek, the uh, mascot, which it was a guy, uh, it was a college student but that would be the mascot, that would dress up like a Plains Indian, which the Illini were not Plains Indians, and he would do this, this, this dance. First time I saw it, knowing what I know about Native culture and how sacred dance is, I was just, ah. uh, but to the people who, who, you know, love that team, the people who were raised in that town, I had one guy tell me he never went to church as a kid. That was the closest thing to a religious experience when the chief came out. But what's interesting about that is the outfit that he wore. It was Lakota Sioux regalia that had been donated to the university museum by a Sioux chief around 1900. And when they developed this mascot in 1920 something, they let him wear that. And they've been wearing it ever since. And if you were a Lakota Sioux Indian living on the reservation at that time, 
you'd be arrested if you were caught wearing that. Which really adds a lot of perspective. My privilege. Yeah. How did the re-education of the children who were sent off succeed? I mean, was it entirely successful or were there, there some that, uh, you know, that, that was, a, there's, was there any recidivism afterwards? Uh, I think there was probably a lot as soon as they got home. Um, if they did, because you know, Native Americans have very low resistance to disease. And when they took people from different tribes and crammed them all together, there were frequently outbreaks of various things that killed large numbers of them. So many of them never got to come home. Now, some of them uh, did go on to become uh, doctors and lawyers and writers and so forth. And of course, the, uh, the biggest success story was the Carlisle Indian School in Pennsylvania, which technically was a college and fielded the greatest college football team of the era in the 1890s to about 1920. Uh, part of that time, Jim Thorpe being their star hack and Pop Warner being their coach. And they just ran rush out over everybody. <clears throat> but there are. So, uh, yes. I, I'm gonna, I ask a question. I, my system has dropped out so many times. I hope I can get this done. Uh, from what you're saying, you're receiving. I hear the term a lot of times, the state within a state, mm -hmm. uh, like the Indians. It, it doesn't sound like there's, that, that's an oversimplification or, or, or it's much more complicated than that, I guess. It's oh, it is much more complicated. And it gets more complicated as the history goes on, as more and more dimensions of complication get added, right? Like this allotment business, it was later reversed and tribal governments were reestablished as we'll talk about next time. But some of those Indians had uh, sold their land and the people they sold it to got to keep it. So there's little checkerboards in Indian reservations now of land in the reservation that's not Indian land. And then there's all kinds of jurisdictional issues there. It may be outside the scope of this course, but I'm just curious as to how much Native American belief systems still exist, you know, after all these years of both, you know, federal government, local government, societal mm -hmm. pressure, and the church in many forms trying to eradicate it. Yeah. Some tribes have done better than others. And to be honest, the bigger the tribe is population wise, the more likely they've been able to hold on to things. Because when they lose their elders, they've not lost as big a proportion of their culture, you know? Uh, there are many tribes that no one speaks the language of that tribe anymore, even though they are living on a reservation. Now, there are, on most reservations and within most Native nations, there's sort of like, there are some people who are traditionalist and adhere to the spiritual approaches of their tribe and others that are Christian uh, that, you know, appreciate their own culture and practice their own culture, but uh, also religiously are not, you know, quite in tune with the more traditionalists there. So that can become interesting. Uh, yeah, anytime there's um, any culture when you've got a new religion moving in, it's never black and white. There right. is so much blend and then this, that, or the, or somewhere in between. Now, here is a theory that I have, an untested theory. And I have asked everyone I know that I thought might know the answer and no one, someone's got to have researched this and, and, and written about it. But have you ever noticed that Native Americans, if they grew up on a reservation, a distinctive accent in English, no matter whether they're from New Mexico or, or Wyoming or Oregon. 
it's kind of a sing song accent. It's kind of in it, you know? Uh, maybe you've never noticed that, but I have. And I just wonder because it's, it's so similar throughout all the different regions where people grew up on reservations. I wonder if that's a result of taking kids from a bunch of different tribes, speaking a bunch of different languages, plopping them down together, making them learn English at once. And then each of them took what they learned there back to their reservation. That sort of that blending may, I, I don't know, sounds like, it sounds, sounds plausible anyway. But I, I know that there are, I've met people. Uh, I'm I'm 52, so people 10, 15 years older than me, Native people, who were taken away from their homes as children. Dennis Banks, one of the co-founders of the American Indian Movement, was taken away and sent to a boarding school as a child. He kept running away. That may have said something about him. Oh, yeah, I sure. Sure. Uh, yeah, Troy, what, when was the Bureau of Indian Affairs established? Is that back then? Yeah, I don't know the exact year. I'm thinking by the 1830s, it was probably around. I'd have yeah. to look it up, but it was around, yeah. Yeah, but it was never run by the American Indians, hardly. It was most of okay, so government. The first commissioner of Indian affairs to actually be an Indian was in the late 1860s. It was mm. Eli Parker, who mm. was Iroquois and had been a union general in the Civil War on the staff of uh, General Grant. Uh, so Grant put him in charge of the Bureau of Indian Affairs. It was a hundred years before another Indian was in charge. Yeah. The late 60s. Now, since about 1968, tradition has always been that always there is a Native American in charge of that, that bureau, except during the Trump administration. I mean, that sounds logical. Trying. Yeah. <laughs> well, like I said, I appreciate the chance just to, uh, yeah. just to kind of like start talking, see where it goes. Well, well we sir, certainly appreciate you being here, Troy. Well, I'm glad y'all were able to make it. Yeah. And, you know, if you think of anything else, uh, jot it down for next time or um, TD Smith at T-N-T-E-C-H Tennessee Tech dot E-D-U. Yeah. I'm, I'm all over the Facebook too. <laughs> to my detriment. Yeah. And I've been trying to, I'm working on this book. I got the sabbatical to finish this book about mistreatment of Native Americans that I'm so ticked off and mad about this mascot thing that I can't, I'm so ticked off by the mistreatment of Native Americans in the backyard <laughs> it's hard to concentrate on. Um, I assume at some point in this discussion you're going to get into Leonard Peltier's case, huh? Oh, of course. Yeah. That's, uh, that to me is, is, is the nail in the coffin, so to speak, that has convinced me that both Democrats and Republicans are completely worthless. <laughs> They've all had a chance to do something, haven't they? Yeah. Yep. Several times. Yep. Here's something to think about. I guess I'll leave you with this to think about. Of course, we are, like I said, going to be talking about American Indian movement, siege of uh, wounded knee and so forth. Those guys in the red power movement within a few years tended to be regarded even by a lot of conservatives I've talked to as great American heroes. And they were using the same tactics as the Black Panthers who oddly enough are not considered great American heroes. <laughs> um, I argue, actually this is what my whole dissertation was about, that American identity in the colonial era came about by trying to figure out the power identity by measuring oneself, if you were a white colonist, against black slaves, 
and American Indians. And with the African American, it's always a debased position because if you've enslaved someone, you have to talk about how inferior they are to justify that, right? It's always the one drop rule, right? Uh, one drop and you are impure. But with the Indian, it kind of vacillates depending on the circumstances and the time that they can be regarded just as viciously. But then once they're safely out of the way, they're idealized and romanticized. I think the very thing that I just mentioned, memory, popular memory of the red power movement compared to the black power movement demonstrates that. You know, there was that, that PBS documentary about the Black Panthers a couple of years ago. And uh, I, don't know, I, I mentioned this during some televised thing I was on and kind of made Becky over there mad at me because I was like, man, that documentary sucks. I don't know if you saw it. They never once, never once mentioned their radical ideology, their revolutionary ideology and what they believed. Not once. Yeah. Now, unlike, you know, obviously the, uh, um, the Rainbow Coalition video, which was great. I think that, again, if you are forcing someone, if you are using their body for labor, you can never, as a culture, allow them to be elevated because it's always going to make you look bad. But if you contend with someone, defeat them and take their land away, not their body, you can retroactively go back and say, they were very noble. How much better does that make me because we beat them? You know? I definitely think there is a lot of that. Yeah. <coughs> well, I guess we're officially done, but I'll still stick around if anybody wants to. <laughs> Troy, I was just telling my sister that I was in this class and she told me I should read Custer Died for Your Sins. Oh, everybody should read that. Okay. I'm Deloria. Yes, you should. Because he was a brilliant thinker. He was one of the foremost thinkers of the uh, National Congress of American Indians. Brilliant thinker, but also so incredibly funny. And the title alone is worth the price of admission. The only <laughs> title from that time period that I like better, and I've tried to assign this in class, but it's out of print, is uh, Watch Out Whitey Black Power Gonna Get Your Mama. <laughs> <laughs> well, <funny. laughs> By a former <laughs> Black Panther. I forget. I, I, his name just flew out of my head. <laughs> it's Julius Lester. Yes, Julius Lester. I knew it was a J. Thank you, Gene. <laughs> and that book also, if you can find a copy of it, my found one for me. I don't know where she found it. Uh, but it is both poignant, biting, and hilarious, just like Vine Deloria's books are. Well, thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Troy. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Well, I hope to see y'all next week. All right. I'll be here. All right. We'll talk soon. Outstanding. Right. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Oh, thanks for having me. Yeah. Bye, y'all.